Hi, everyone and folks online. Um, if we have not met before, my name is Sydney Kraviak and I'm the Program and Outreach Coordinator here at the library. So I help plan and organize programs for adults here. And I first met Dr. Candy DeBerry at one of our um, other plant gardening programs and she's come to stuff for um, our plant swap that we've done. She came to the seed exchange and we got to talking and uh, she has a list of talks that she does. We're very excited to have her here with us this evening. She is a professor down at WNJ and she is going to speak to us about compost. Thank you. Thanks for coming, people who are here in person. Thanks for tuning in, I guess, or zooming in, people who are remote. And I believe this is going to be recorded and available in the future. So for all of you future people who are, you know, listening to this 25 years from now or whatever, hi. Um, so yeah, I'm a professor of biology at WNJ, and what I talk about has absolutely nothing to do directly with what I'm going to talk about tonight. So my my areas are biochemistry, cell biology, and specifically cancer biology. Except for the overall, of course, environmental conditions, this um, this had very little to do with the WNJ stuff. Uh, this I say the WNJ stuff is what I do so that I can pay for my real life garden. So I'll start with the noun part. What is compost? Dead stuff. Dead stuff. So the other night, our youngest cat brought me a dead mouse, literally in the middle of the night, 4 a.m. Hmm. Okay, bad description. No, that's a great start. <clears throat> Decomposing dead stuff. Decomposed dead stuff. So I needed to not have known the mouse was there and let it go for a couple of weeks or something, and then it would have been a little closer to compost. It's actually decomposed organic matter. Organic. So the mouse would definitely count, right? So would the weeds that you pulled this morning, or the vegetable peelings that from making lunch or dinner, or all sorts of other things. So that's the noun, what is compost, but I also think of compost as a verb, right? something that you do, although also people refer to it as composting. But why? Why would you do compost? Why are you here? Why am I trying to convince you to do this on whatever scale will work for you? And there are really three areas of benefit. One area is the environmental benefit that by composting your organic waste, or at least some portion of it, you, you reduce your environmental, negative environmental impact. You can actually have a positive impact, talk about that. Another is that you can save money in multiple ways, directly and indirectly. And another is that it can be used to enrich your garden directly. They're all kind of tied together. So I want to start with the environmental aspects. Composting and compost itself are a great example of the environmental four R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle, restore. And I want to talk briefly about how each one of those four R's is tied into compost and compost. So first, reduce. By using that organic waste to make compost, you reduce the amount of stuff that goes to the landfill that is literally thrown away and taking up space and resources to get it there. This is insane. The estimate is up to 120 billion pounds of food, perfectly fine food thrown away just in the United States every year. We waste more than any other country. That's like 40% of the food in the US is wasted. Somewhere from you know, the farm field to you know, you know, molding in the back of your refrigerator or left over at the restaurant because you didn't finish your meal, you didn't take it home and get thrown out. Or, right. Um, got a blemish at the grocery store, and oh my gosh, that banana has a brown spot, so I'm going to throw it out and try to sell it. 
So 40%, up to half a pound of food waste a day per person. So of course that has all sorts of implications, including environmental implications if that's thrown away. And all of those nutrients and all of those resources in that food, that organic matter is wasted. A lot of that ends up being hauled off the landfills. And up to 50% of the material in landfills is material that could be used to make compost. And all of those resources, those nutrients could be captured and put back into the earth instead of just tossed into a landfill and taken out of the sun. Maybe as much as 20% or even more is food waste. And maybe 15% or even more is yard waste. So these are the grass clippings that people bag up and throw away. These are the trimmings from the hedges and the trees. These are the weeds that people pull and so on. All of those could potentially be recycled as compost. Another thing that people tend not to think about is the actual impact of using fossil fuels to haul that stuff off to the landfill. Because diesel garbage trucks are the least fuel efficient vehicles, non-military, on our roads. They get less than three miles per gallon. Waste management doesn't run on diesel anymore. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> waste management doesn't run on diesel. Yeah, you know what? Deep waste I management runs on waste years. management runs on cleaner burning natural gas, yeah, right? That's right. Yeah. And you know why they call it cleaner you burning? Just had to, you put the green truck up there, so I had to yep. speak up. <laughs> yep. And you know why they call it cleaner burning? Because they want you to focus on the fact that when it burns, there are fewer pollutants, and ignore the fact that getting to that point is worse than mining coal and burning. Hmm. It's called greenwashing, people. Natural gas, from start to finish, is not better. You want to run it on electricity, run it off solar. But that's a whole other story to talk about afterwards. So yes, there are fewer pollutants coming out of that vehicle, but to get the gas to that vehicle is as bad, if not worse. And if it's running off diesel, that's only about 7% of the vehicles on the road now. More or less, that number has been stable for a while. But more than two-thirds of particulate air pollutants come from that. 40% of nitric oxides and nitrates and really nasty contributors, for instance, to acid rain, come from that burning diesel. So there's that consideration. What about reuse? All of that stuff that came out of the earth originally can go back in and be reused to produce more stuff. And you can use it as a soil amendment. Notice I'm not saying fertilizer, although it does have nutrients but a soil amendment. A lot of people do that as amending their soil. 40-pound um, bag of kind of average lawn fertilizer, which is mostly nitrogen, and the whole point of that is just to green up the grass. Two and a half gallons of gasoline worth of energy to make that taking nitrogen from the air and fixing it is the term, or converting the nit N2 gas in the air into a form like ammonium nitrate that can be, or urea, can be used as a fertilizer is the single most energy intensive industrial process that humans use. It's called the, the um, Haber-Bosch process. Whereas the nitrogen that's present in the compost, for instance, 
didn't have to go through any of that industrial fixation to capture the nitrogen out of the air. Plus, mentioned cost. There's your Ace Hardware just down the road. That's what they're charging for a bag of this stuff. Put that into some perspective. Well, so 80 million tons or more spread across lawns, most of which don't need it in the US. And at least probably half of that is just lost or more and run off, contributing to all sorts of downstream effects, polluting water supplies, um, drinking water. A lot of those nitrogen-based compounds are known to be toxic and cause things like birth defects, miscarriages. That's a whole other story. And that's fast release, right? You get that lawn green up in a, in a few days. Um, you don't see that with compost or other organic-based type of soil amendments. It's slow. It feeds gently and slowly. And so you, it'll take longer for your lawn to green up, but there'll be less collateral damage, I guess. Thanks for the question. Uh -huh. Once that stuff is put on someone's lawn, is the grass no longer compostable? Um... So if it's just fertilizer, it should be okay because if you're putting in your compost, you're mixing with lots of other stuff. So it's kind of diluting down that concentrated nitrogen. But a lot of times if you have True Green or some company come by, they'll mix it with herbicides, right? The weed and feed. And then I wouldn't touch it. Uh, not even for ornamentals, and certainly not for vegetable or fruit production. I might put it in the compost and let it go for a year or two, but so if you do use, say, grass clippings in your compost, make sure you know that they're not from that from a source. If the neighbor wants to offer you their grass clippings, make sure that they're not getting the weeded feed on them or they're putting it on themselves. My neighbor has a pile of just grass and things and it's been sitting for years and said I take whatever I wanted, but I mean take from the bottom. Yeah. My uh, my one of my neighbors actually dumps grass clippings along our hedgerow in the very back of the property. And we take from the bottom. There's so about five yeah. Five. Yeah. <laughs> and we we take from the bottom so we know that it's been composted and I don't I, I don't use it I don't on food. They do on their lawn. Right. And you're not always, don't feel always comfortable. Yeah. I do notice um, a lot of that stuff has very distinctive smell. Right? It has that urea smell. If you're not familiar with the smell of urea, just go into some place like, you know, Agway or Ace Hardware or something and go up to that high nitrogen fertilizer and sniff it. It's a very distinctive smell. Yeah. And I, you can smell it if someone has treated their lawn for at least several hours, maybe longer. You can definitely smell it. Yeah. So anyway, get it back into the soil. Sorry. No, no, these are great questions. We lose soil at a ridiculous rate, and it takes an extremely long time to replenish it. In natural processes, it can take anywhere from 100 to maybe 500 years or more to replace an inch of soil. If it's been washed away, used up, eroded, whatever. So we're depleting our soils for all sorts of reasons much faster than we are replacing them. And much, much faster than nature can do it without our help. Putting compost back in restores a lot of that. And of course, speaking of restore or renew, that's really what most gardeners are focused on with the compost. Thinking about the environmental impacts that I've mentioned and maybe others like reducing methane emissions, but really about enriching their garden, whether it's ornamental, whether they're growing fruit or vegetables or a mix or whatever. Getting some humus back into the soil, organic matter. For lots of reasons. 
increasing the fertility, all that nitrogen and potassium and phosphorus and calcium and boron and magnesium and all the other macro elements and micro elements that the plants need are inside that compost. By putting um, chunks of organic matter back in the soil, you open up some air spaces. And around here with a lot of people, you dig down a few inches or maybe it's right up close to the top and you've got clay, really fine particles that are tight to together, poorly draining, not much air in there. You try to grow things that aren't you know, wetland plants, then the roots can literally suffocate. You've got to get air down to the roots and open up those spaces. And that also deals with this texture of the soil, what farmers call tilth. Dry soil, there's moisture retention. That organic matter acts like little sponges, but also think sponges have holes, right? So stuff can move through, water can move through. And another really important thing around here, depending on what you're trying to grow, um, it helps to neutralize the pH. And a lot of the soil around here is acidic okay, or too acidic for a lot of crops. There are some crops that prefer or some plants that prefer um, azaleas, for instance, um, mountain laurels, rhododendrons, things like that, definitely acidic soils. Blueberries, acidic soils, a wonderful native plant that everyone should use as an ornamental, it's a terrific plant. Um, potatoes like a little more acid, but most, for instance, of our vegetable and fruit crops prefer things a little less acidic than our native soils. So this can help make the soil less acid. So lots and lots of other benefits too. But basically, putting more compost in your garden has multiple benefits that are going to enhance the growth of almost anything. But how do you do it? So there are a lot of very technical ways. There are a lot of very difficult ways, very challenging ways, very labor intensive ways. And then there are also very low energy, lazy ways. There's actually called lazy composting. It just takes longer. So I want to go through some of the basics and introduce to you what's probably going to be the classic way and then show you some variations on that that are adaptable to whatever scale you might want to attempt. But there are, no matter where you try this or how, there are four things that you're going to need. Water, air, time, and organic matter. Things that are very high in carbon atoms and things that are very high in nitrogen atoms. So what are called browns and greens. So time, air, water. Okay, you may have to drag the hose or buckets down to your compost pile. Um, but the biggest input is just gathering up that material and piling it up and maybe turning it once in a while. So what can you put in there and then what you shouldn't put in there? Browns. Probably one of the most thrown away resources for, in gardening is leaves in the autumn. All those bags, and those nice contractor bags sitting by the road waiting to be picked up. Go out and load them in your trunk and take them home, people. People are they throwing it away. Garbage. When people do that, I never knew what happened. They go through regular garbage and people do that. Uh, it, not a, it depends on the area. Depends like on the area. Township, whenever they do it, they end up like taking and do like the leaf mulch. You're supposed to do it every year. Uh, so I'm not sure yeah. about other municipalities. If that was yeah, it depends though. on your municipality. <laughs> but, um, and I know my municipality at least used to collect them and then there was literally a spot on the edge of town where they literally literally threw it over a cliff because I found it and then I started gathering it up and bringing it home 
Um, so one of my favorite fall activities is leaf beefing, which is going around. I can tell you that 15 contractor bags can fit into a uh, 2018 Prius if there's only if you only have the driver. Um, I, yeah. So my record for one year, I had 158. I haven't. I've got to work on that. But, but dry leaves. The key is too that you don't want someone who treats their lawn, right? So that does that affect the leaves? Well, if they're raking up the leaves, the chances in any of that stuff that's on the grass or in the grass gets in is very low. As far as the leaf eventually. Yeah. Happens. Oh, that's good. Yeah. No, I didn't know. It. And we're going to let them decompose for a while. And you're thinking about you're getting them in the fall. The chances that you won't use any of that compost probably until spring. So everything's been degrading for six months or so. And in pretty extreme conditions, too. Think about how wet it is here in the winter and all of the temperature variations. So there can be a lot of damage to those chemicals over the time. Even if they have trees are treated, just they spray stuff right on the mm, That, yeah, it, yeah, it depends. I mean, I, um, so if you know that someone's done that, I'd avoid it. Some trees better than others are better than others? Or? That is a really big question. Are some, they do have slightly different amounts of the different, at least the big, big three, the NPKs, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, the big thing with that is to, there are a couple to avoid, well, there's really one to avoid walnut. And the reason you want to avoid walnut, and I mentioned this later, is that they have chemicals that are allelopathic, which means they inhibit the germination of seeds from other plants. So do sunflowers, by the way. So that's why people say don't use walnut leaves, don't use walnut um, wood chips, um, why it can be very difficult to plant under or around walnut trees, even though I have walnuts all over my yard and nothing around them is being carved because the squirrels bring them from the wetlands and plant them. So I'm constantly cutting down the walnuts that they've planted where I don't want them. What about oaks? Because I just know that oaks are poisonous. All parts of the, not, not like toxic, toxic, but yes, they say avoid any kind of oak trees. So. I'd love to see that source. Send me that source. Yeah, I love to see that source. Send me that source uh, because they don't let your dogs eat oak leaves. I mean, they're ha they're filled with tannic acid. So, I mean, oak oak bark and oak wood uh, has traditionally been used to tan leather, for instance. Um, oak is tough; it doesn't break down very easily. So, if you um, you know want to put them in your compost pile, you might want to shred them up or something beforehand. Run over them with the lawnmower, or you know, I have all winter put armloads of oak leaves in the chickens run and just let them scratch around for a day or two and then raked it out, put it in a compost pile after they had broken it up, added a little chicken manure, and then um, put some more in. But oaks are the single most important plant that in this region that you can plant for um, butterflies and moths, our most important wildlife. They host more than 500 different species of butterflies and moths. And everybody eats caterpillars, right? So if you want the birds or the other wildlife, then an oak is the single most important keystone species. You can have. Does it matter it. Like, what species of oak? It's nat native. It's like red oak. It's you want to like plant natives always. Because non-natives haven't been here in your area long enough to evolve relationships with the other wildlife. So they, they're not used by wildlife. Should you plant uh, two of the same species together or they can go by themselves? One? Um, I don't know how, off the top of my head, how self-fertile different species of oaks are. Um, it, but that's really about getting acorns, right? And not about producing leaves, which are the caterpillar and butterfly food, the moth and butterfly food. Yeah. I've been down at Mingo uh, when the kids were little and they start, started the oats and 
uh, seedlings. Mm -hmm. you know, at least you could take one that's at least started. You that's know, awesome. And baby it. So oh, and by the way, plant them around the park. While we're on oaks, everyone's like, I don't have room. I was, I don't have room in my backyard for an oak, right? Because you think 75 feet, 100 feet. No, there are two varieties, there are two species of oak that are dwarfs that are native to Pennsylvania that only that make it to about 15 or 20 foot high shrubs. So there are dwarf oak shrubs, two species native to Pennsylvania. Okay, get back to the dry leaves, yeah. Any of the developments that are built have to put in tree and they put in pin oaks? Pin oaks are native. Considered native? Pin oaks are native to this area. If you want to do something, get in. If you are so unfortunate as to belong to an HOA, yeah. get in there and get lobbying for them. The best thing would be to say all of their landscaping has to be natives to their area, and they have to allow individuals to plant for wildlife. Maryland, they are legally obligated to do that. Pennsylvania isn't. Leaves. So one thing you can do is add them to the compost pot, mix them with other stuff. The other is you can just use them to make leaf mold. And if you have the British spelling, there's a U in there after the O. Um, it's not the mold that grows in your shower. Um, it's basically decomposed leaves. So this is not mixed with other stuff. This is just the leaves. Put them in a bin or a pile or circle of chicken wire or just in a pile in the back of your property and let them go. And that's often, that's usually considered the absolute best options. This is the best compost. Mm -hmm. And it's really simple. Just collect them. If you can get a variety, that's great. If you can avoid walnut, that's great. If you have some walnut mixed in with everything else, the impact's probably going to be very minimal. Unless you have, you know, 20 walnut trees and that's all you have. Um, put them in some type of bin if you don't want them blowing in the neighbor's yard. Make sure they're damp. So you might want to get the hose out there or watering can and just make sure that as you layer them in, they're damp. Usually it's always the damp as a wrung out sponge. Okay. If it's dry, it'll just take longer to decompose. Okay. And then let it go. Until they're what little thing. Until whenever. I mean, you could use that. You could you you could use that for mulch for sure. But um it can get just really fine. And oh, I'm sorry, for mulch, not the fertilizer, for mulch. Well, mulch. Okay. This type of mulch, if you're using compost for mulch or leaf mold, it's going to break down really quickly. So it's not like the wood chip stuff mm -hmm. that's big and dense and might be there for a couple of years. This is the kind of stuff that will probably break down over a season. But as it does that, even the wood chips underneath, it's adding organic matter and there's nutrients back to us. Yeah. Imagine you're not having clay soil, which is a lot of the soil here. So how do you get your, like I have, my beds are mulched over here in the northern, but the soil is still mm -hmm. clay. What Pile happens? it on and grow on top is really the advice. Just keep putting more organic matter on the top. When you start digging down there, there are all sorts of issues. One is that you are bringing weed seeds to the surface. Some of those weed seeds can persist for decades and hundreds of years. Another thing is you're just you are disturbing the soil microorganisms, disrupting those threads of fungi and things, um, and probably killing a lot of that microscopic life. That's really crucial to doing things like. Providing nutrients for plants. A lot of worms in my credit, which is surprising. Hopefully, they're not the jumping worms. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about invasive jumping worms after. Okay. Um, so that's great because they're providing holes for aeration. Fun. If you think about if you want to dig them up, and, and they're going to migrate toward the organic matter. So they should be figuring out that food is up and we're going to go up and grab some and drag it down in our burrows. And then we're going to put worm castings out the back end. And then you have this beautiful nutrient rich, not manure, enriching your soil. But, yeah. 
the yeah, the thought, really the paradigm now in gardening is to disturb the soil as little as possible. And farming to disturb the soil as little as possible. If it's really terrible, you might want to just dig a bunch of compost and stuff in one time and then do the add-on. So other things, twigs, branches, straw, sawdust, wood chips, bark, paper towels, paper napkins, toilet paper tubes, shredded newspaper, anything that you think of as a brown, it's really carbon rich. They are right cartons. Oh, they're great. Okay. Yeah, those paper egg cartons. Sawdust. My husband is a woodworker and you throws lucky out dogs. contractor bags full of it. Yeah, so um, you could literally but sprinkle part of it thin might be bulk. Some of it might be. Yeah, but it'll be mixed with. So one mulch. thing you could do is use that just for the direct mulch okay. around your plants. I would just put a thin layer, or you might want to mix it with something like grass clippings or leaves or compost. Okay. But one of the things with the compost pile is you're going to be putting usually a lot of other stuff in there, right? And sometimes even turning it and mixing it up. Yeah. So a little bit of something like that that might cause a problem in high concentration, yeah. it's really not going to have much of an impact if you dilute it with all that other stuff and let it sit for a year or two or whatever. Yeah. Right? Um, and then there are the greens. Yeah. This is the glories of rotting garbage, right? So the vegetable peels. So this is the kind of stuff that at our house, a lot of it actually doesn't go into the compost anymore. A lot of it goes into the chicken beaks. So uh, they've diverted from my compost stream, my hens. But if you don't have hens, and that's a whole other story you want to talk about chickens, um, vegetable peels, fruit peels, rinds, not just that coffee grounds, Tea leaves, um, eggshells are considered greens, nitrogen rich materials that you can put into the compost. Notice I haven't even talked about like how you build the pile. I'm just talking about getting the stuff together. If you have the eggshells and they have residue of egg in it, is that okay? That's fine. Okay. You might, have, you know, we've got to worry about somebody getting in there and licking it out, right? So we're going to talk about things like raccoons and skunks a little bit later. We're coming. We're coming, yeah. yeah. Horse manure. Is that a nitrogen? I'm getting there. We're getting there. Yeah, we're getting to herbivore manures. But first, I mentioned grass clippings. So, of course, you have to be concerned about the treated grass. But really, best thing to do is grass cycle. Why take all that grass away with all those nutrients that the grass needs and then go and buy that $69, sorry, Ace Hardware, that $69 bag of stuff of Ace Hardware and put it back on to get more grass that you have to mow and put the clippings away. So this is called grass cycling. Mow it high and let it lie. Mow it about three inches, let it lie. And they, it, especially now, so many people have mulching mowers. And they're fantastic because unless you, you get let the grass get really tall, you really don't see the clippings or you see the clippings for a few hours and then they dry up and go down between the blades. So you don't even see those lines of chunks of grass that you used to in the old when I was growing up, you know, and dad let the lawn get too high. So that's one possibility. Now I would admit, I do collect grass clippings sometimes and use them, mix them with other things and use them for mulch. Sometimes I let them lie. Weeds, you can throw in the compost pile. You probably want to avoid it if they've gone to seed. Because it's very difficult in a home compost pile to get the temperatures hot enough, or at least a lot of people probably don't want to put in the time and effort or have the time and effort to get the temperatures hot enough for long enough to kill those seeds. So if the crabgrass is going to seed, eh, you might want to just put that in the trash or leave it lie out in the sun or put it in a black plastic bag and leave it lie in the sun for a few weeks and then put it in the compost pile when everything's dead. Here's your horse manure. Um, as long as it's from herbivores, you're fine. So not carnivores, right? You don't want your dog your cat 
droppings. And there's, of course, there are parasite issues with that possibly as well. But herbivores, so this is your bunny, right? This is your guinea pig. These are your horses, the cattle, um, and so on. There are some other things that you might want to add in small amounts. Um, some people like to sprinkle a little wood ashes from your fireplace or your wood stove. High in potassium and, and phosphorus, but just a little bit because they are, tend to be pretty basic and you don't want to, okay, you have acidic soil, but you don't want to make it too far in the other direction and make it too basic or too sweet instead of too sour. Some people will put on like soybean meal or alfalfa meal or blood meal high in nitrogen. Okay, that's stuff you have to buy, but it can be pretty cheap if you buy it at Agway or whatever, big bales. Crushed rock dust, um, garden soil is always a great idea. Just throw a shovel in there once in a while because it has all the microorganisms, the bacteria, the fungi, um, the little tiny insects you can't even see without a microscope that are in there, they're helping to break down that compost. And, and the worms and the springtails and on and on and on, the nematodes, the round worms and the flatworms and everybody who's eating away at that, those chunks you put in there, breaking it into smaller pieces. Lime to lime. Yeah. Some people will put a little sprinkling of lime in, so you'll pick up some calcium. You'll decrease the acidity a little bit, but I mean, literally like a dusting. Okay. Stand of any value? Um, probably not. As a matter of fact, a lot of people say don't put sand in your soil, even if you have heavy like clay soil, because you basically end up making cement. Oh, true. Here's another one. <clears throat> okay, Peters. P, human urine. Unless you have a UTI, it's sterile. People, okay, and who else, right? The Brits, right? Yeah, come on, you. Advance. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's not a movie. I saw that. That's actually a public um, garden in Cambridgeshire, England, <laughs> and that's called a pea bale. It is a real thing. Um, but Brits were, and not just Brits, but many other people for centuries have been saving their night soil as well, not just urine, but especially urine. You catch it, collect it, dilute it one to 10 with water. It is dilute enough that you can actually use it probably for your ornamentals, maybe not your food. So you're like, but my dog peed on the lawn and there's a big dead area. That's because he didn't dilute his pee before. <laughs> if you said, put Rover, go in this bucket and then I'll add 10, nine volumes of water, <laughs> then it would be okay. But this is the thing and look what they're doing high nitrogen urine onto high carbon straw, carbon and nitrogen. And then what they do when they get saturated, they spread it, they put them in the compost pile. And there you have a beautiful mixture of carbon and nitrogen um, that would have, that nitrogen especially would have otherwise been literally flushed away. It's a thing, it's called pea cycling. <laughs> And there was this French company that developed these urinals. You could buy them in plastic, or if you want to class up and spend a little more money, you can buy them in stainless steel. Um, that hook into these bales of straw, and apparently they are a big thing at like outdoor festivals in Europe. <laughs> Think about how many times have you stood in line for the porta potty? Seriously, seriously, think about it. Well, then if you put them around the perimeter of the perimeter of your garden, you'll keep the deer away too. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. but you don't have and think about it. You're at the far end, you're in the back 40, and it's like, oh my God, I gotta go, right? And you're covered in mud. Who really wants to run in the house and kick their shoes off? Do you have time for that? No, there's a bucket in the shed. 
Not what other podcasts are. I shouldn't be telling on myself. <laughs> I just dumped my bucket in the mine. The father was fun. He taught him to do that into the compost and all around the outside of the garden fence. I've heard when of people I went to preschool. We had to explain to that to other people. Yeah. But I have heard. I have read about people who have invited men to their garden to leave a perimeter to deter the deer, supposedly. I don't know. But I do know that if you want to try this at your next outdoor festival. These are about 30 bucks a piece Don't from this French community, company. Community day went just Saturday. I, I oh, missed okay. next year. <laughs> there are goals for next year. That's why it's yeah. called Peter's Township. Yeah. So what do you use? And the thing is that actually <clears throat> those top three bullets, they're all organic and they will decay. And I will put them in sometimes. They're pieces of cheese that you know, the moldy cheese that got lost in the back of the fridge sneaks in. The meat and bones and dairy products and fats and greases and oils to avoid are mainly because they can kind of get rancid and smelly and they can attract creatures that find them tasty. And then you come out and you find someone's scattered your compost all over your yard. So it's not really that they're not organic and won't decay. Okay. They will give in time, but they can get stink, particularly stinky and attract other creatures that would like to consume them. Dog and cat feces, there actually are ways, there are little composter things that you can use dog and cat feces in. But the concern carnivores and parasites. It can be transmitted to humans if the compost pile doesn't kill them, doesn't heat up enough to kill those parasites. So you want to avoid that charcoal. And I mean the charcoal briquettes, like the kings for charcoal briquettes that you use in a charcoal grill. Um, there are some pretty nasty chemicals that persist in those. You don't want those. Weeds, I mentioned going to seed, the little pathic plants like walnuts and sunflower, plants that are diseased, for instance, those sad tomatoes in October that have, you know, blight. You don't want to put those blight spores back into your garden. I've also garlic, turns out. Yeah, I didn't know this. And I just started last year after reading from a lot of garlic growers that they actually don't compost anything from the garlic. It's sort of everything away to break the disease cycle. There you go. Uh, garlic, we'll worry about that in a minute. A lot of people have fire pits. Mm -hmm. And you take the ash, like the ash from the bottom of that, is that of any value? If they're burning wood. Well, yeah. You should yeah. Have if they're burning wood, or paper. Think, yeah. just grab some and sprinkle. So you've gathered all your stuff, or you're going to commit to gathering up some of this stuff. Where do you put it? Location, 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 right? So there are a couple things you have to think about. The neighbors, right? Um, how much sun it gets. So more sun, more evaporation of moisture. You might still water it more. And also the further away it is, the less likely it's going to be that you make a habit of feeding it. It'll be less convenient. Um, so a close, bow, a close pile is a used pile. Then the question is, are you going to confine it? And if you're going to confine that stuff, what are you going to put it in? Are you going to bin it or not bin it? So that comes back to how tidy do the neighbors need it? How tidy do you want it? What's your personal aesthetic? And are there critters in your neighborhood that might try to get into it and feast on what you put out there? So what's the raccoon pressure? What's the skunk pressure? What's the roaming dog pressure? And so on. Bins. Wow, this is crazy. You can spend a ton of money on these things or a ton of time making them. And you can find something for almost any aesthetic you want. Okay. But money, if you're going to build it, time and effort and your skill level. <clears throat> what about the other critters that might want to break in? And also, uh, back to aesthetics. Where does it need to be? And you can do anything. You can get these plastic tumblers that would be good for kind of more rapid compost, but they don't hold a lot. You can get the classic plastic earth bins, and these are the ones that tend to be given away at the composting presentations of composting workshops by people like master gardeners. And these are great. This is actually what we put our chicken um, litter in. So the pine shavings and straw and the 
leaves and things. Because the chicken litter really has to compost for about a year. It's very nitrogen rich. Um, too much to put directly on plants. So I have my own little earth bin for chicken poop. Um, if you want a little more rustic, I love this one. This is not mine. Mine is coming. But that's somebody who put a lot of time and skill in three different bins in three different stages. So this is the um, sophisticated rustic. Mm -hmm. This is tidy and pleasing, but not quite as sophisticated. What are the in, three stages? Sorry. To oh, they're just, they're filling one up and then moving on to the next so that you'll probably, you'll have compost in different um, points along the process. So some will be just starting and maybe from the first bin you started, you can take from earlier. So it's kind of a continuous flow. Okay, I, I think we're moving from bin to bin. We're not supposed to be moving it. Just there. Some people move it from bin to pen and other people don't. Yeah, there are so many ways to compost. Trust me, there's so many. But some people will turn it and move it from bin to bin. And other people will fill one up, let her go, and then start working on the next one or the next one and the next one. And like expandable, right? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. For, for the far right, if that's completely full, how do you turn it? Do you try to? You still have to turn it, don't you? Uh, no. Oh. Or yes. It depends. We're going to get there. I'll okay. show you. Sorry. I'll show you the energetic way to do it and the lazy way to do it. <laughs> okay. Um, but notice those boards are actually in slots, so they're right. removable. You can build it up or tear it down. Right. So this is simpler. The, the pallets from the back of Ace Hardware or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, still tidy. This is the minimalist approach in terms of appearance and effort. This is what mine used to look like. I actually got torn down and turned into a garden bed. So this actually is the end of fall so that the vine that was on it has died back. So in the, in the sub spring and summer, it was covered by this nice vine and it was a little less visible. View from the other side, yay, it's a compost pile, right? The glories of rotting vegetables. What do you do with that stuff? That's not in my kitchen. So how do you get the stuff from the kitchen, for instance, to the compost pile? And there are all different ways. I mean, we tend to put a bucket on the back uh, deck and bring stuff out. And whenever we remember, literally, we take it to the compost pile and dump it. There are all sorts of little bins, like the green ones on the, on the right, that you can buy there are really fancy ones that are beautiful and you can sit on your kitchen table. Um, ceramics and stainless steel and pottery and pork, stick it under the sink. Um, we also, especially in the winter when you might not want to trudge to the back 40 every day or snowstorm, I don't want to dig my way to the compost pile. We just took an old trash can, drilled about six, have, have three quarter inch diameter holes in the bottom off the deck and we would just throw the compost in there and in the winter it's not decomposing much doesn't smell much it's not being broken into by animals and if we had a nice warm day a little spring thaw it's on wheels just drag it down and empty it so there were ways that we could kind of collect it without having to have it sit around the house without having it stinking things up, getting in the way, tripping over it, without having to worry about critters in it, without having to worry about trudging through the mud or the snow or whatever, or just the day that you were tired and didn't know, got home late and it was dark and you didn't feel like going to the pump post. So the holes, is that because it, it turns to liquid and you want Yeah, to just to let any liquid drink. That out, yeah, yeah. I save all my clippings during the winter and put them in a plastic bag in the freezer. I've heard of people right that too. Where I'm ready to work in my garden, I boil them for six hours to get this rich vegetable broth. Oh. And then I throw the You made smoothies stuff. for your plants. I, and then I throw the, the cooked stuff That's fantastic. in the bin. But then I have, I strained it and I've got this brown vegetable broth from all the different oh. I so use it, I use it for all my soups. Oh. Okay, we're going to her house and when she's <laughs> tell us to know when this is happening. All right, can soups galore. There we go. So if you want to build a pile, you're usually told put something coarse in the bottom. This is the twigs, the branches, sunflower stalks, maybe a few, something like that to let air flow. 
but that's one of the things you need. Air, water, browns and greens, time. And then pile stuff on. Now, for the people who are really into it and really want compost fast, right, maybe in a few, literally a few weeks or months, they might even save piles of things and then mix it, you know, kind of scientifically precisely. I am very much, if I have it, it gets thrown on the pile and it just keeps piling up. Okay. So the add as you go approach. I'm a very lazy composter. The question about the twigs. Mm -hmm. On average, how long does it take for a twig to decompose? That is hard to answer because it depends on what type of wood it is. It depends on how, are you talking about my thumb thick or my finger thick? Or? Say, uh, Double your thumb size, like silver maple. Sorry. Silver maple's pretty soft. So in a year, it might be gone. Um, I'm going to show you some a different way to break those down and use them in your garden. Instead of putting in your compost pile, put them in the bottom of your raised beds when you're making a new raised bed. It's called a hoople culture, and I'm getting there. But... So people say alternate greens and browns, you know, don't make the layers more than six inches thick, moisten the layer. You know, you get these beautiful diagrams of what the perfect compost pile looks like, blah, 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 blah. And then you'll be told the optimum ratio of carbon and nitrogen is about three to one by volume. And you're out there like, oh my God, how do I, three wheelbarrows of this, one wheelbarrow of that, one and a half wheelbarrows. And you're like, ah, oh, and you get freaked out about it. And the reality is, then no matter how you do it, it's going to happen. It's just going to happen at different rates. You do need some moisture if you want it to go at any reasonable rate. They always say like a wrung out sponge. If you're throwing something really moist on there, like cooked vegetables, then don't. You don't have to water that layer. And it's already there. Or if it rains on it, it's great. Do you need something to speed it up? You can buy things like this, the compost starters, the compost accelerant. And they'll help. A lot of them are just high, high nitrogen compounds. They may have some microorganisms, some bacteria in them, or mold spores or something, fungus spores. But the reality is, you don't need that at all. If you're worried about getting some microorganisms in there to help decompose, throw a shovel of soil on there or a shovel of compost. Borrow some compost from somebody else to get you started. It won't cost you $21.99. It'll cost you a neighborly visit. <laughs> um, soybean or alfalfa meal people recommend because it's high in nitrogen. Some urine, diluted urine, same kind of things. So yeah, if you want to do that, that's great. And it will probably speed things up somewhat, but it's absolutely not necessary. So there are cheap ways to do it. What's happening in there? Those things are being broken down mechanically. So you know, worms are chewing on it, insects are chewing on it, and also chemically. And there's an enormous soil food web in there happening. But I'm not going to take the time to go through all the details. Um, and I'm not a soil, soil microbiologist by any stretch of the imagination. But you're letting the living things, many of which are so small you can't see them, break down that material for you over time, as well as the weather, right? freezing and thawing and such. And if it's working, it'll heat up. I have had compost piles so hot that I couldn't stick my hand in there. It'll heat up. Now, depending on the ratio of carbon and nitrogen, how big your pile is, how wet it is, you might not really be able to feel it. Some people get compost thermometers and make you know, to turn this into a science project. Um, I don't. I don't. I just let it go because I have other things to do. Um, but the good thing about a really hot pile is that if you get it hot enough for long enough, it'll kill the weeds. It'll kill the insect eggs and larvae. It'll kill the seeds. It'll kill any disease organisms, maybe the tomato blight spores or su such. So you can make compost that is literally killer compost 
is called hot conference, but it means more work. This is when you get out there and turn it. And I've seen recommendations for as much as, as frequently as twice a day, even turning that pile to get more air in, to mix everything up, to get fresh food to the, to the you know, insects and the bacteria and such, to make sure that it's moist. But you might have compost in two or three weeks or a month. I am not a fast, active, hot composter. I am a slow, passive, lazy composter. Throw it on there and forget it. I used to actually turn the compost every couple of weeks and it's like, this is insane. I don't have time. For, I had, No, no, I had other things. So layer it and forget it. That's it. No matter how, oops, compost is going to happen. The only difference is how fast. Is there a temperature though that's... Yeah, they're saying 150, 160 degrees Fahrenheit for several days. Yeah. And the commercial compost operations, I mean, they have these you know, huge piles that they're turning with front end loaders and such. So what about problems? Skim through these. If well, people are worried about it, I can't, I can't build my compost pile because it's going to smell, because the raccoons are going to get it, because whatever. If it smells, you either have too much nitrogen material, too many greens, you have too much moisture, or you put some of those things that can go rancid, like butter or cheeses or fats on the pile. So add some more carbon. Put some newspaper in there. Put some dry leaves in there. Turn it, maybe. Um, mix it up a little better and bury some new things more deeply. So if you do have uh, that hunk of Parmesan that molded, stick it, dig a little hole and stick it down in there. Pests, and I'm not talking about your HOA. Um, pests, right? Um, usually there's something that's very attractive to the skunks and the raccoons or the dogs that they would like to eat that smells good. And where it's warm, which that's a natural byproduct. If you're going to do that, then either put the tasty, juicy, smelly stuff way down deep in there, bury it down in there, or make sure you get a bin that they can't break into. Um, maybe a better lid than that one. Rocky's pretty adept. But secure it in a bin. Slow decomposition I already talked about. So I'm going to kind of go through that one again. What I do want to do is, when's it finished? <laughs> when the pile's not hot anymore, when it's dark brown, it smells sweet and earthy like forest floor. When it's crumbly. Yours might not look like that. I don't, I use mine before it ever looks like that. I use mine when there's still big chunks in it. And I'll either just use the chunks or I'll sift through the chunks with the garden fork. Or take the big pieces and throw them back on the pile and just use the smaller pieces. It'll break down. But that's kind of the black gold, you know, the goal. And this is, a, this. you don't have to get an A plus on this. You don't need 100%. All you need to do is pass. And it's almost impossible to fail. Okay? So what do you do with it? No, I wish I looked that elegant when I'm gardening. I don't look like that's what I think I look like, right? Look at that. Perfect. Look at the, look at the shoes. Seriously. Seriously. This is like the shot for the British Gardening Magazine, right? So you can use it as a mulch. Now, it is going to break down faster than that wood chip mulch that you buy from ANS Landscaping, right? But it's also going to add more nutrients to your soil faster. Um, people will spread it on their lawn. <clears throat> Don't tell Scott's, you know, turf builder, whatever. Or what I usually do is incorporate into the soil when I'm planting. So I'm planting a tomato, I'll put a little spade full of compost in the bottom, or I'll put it over top of my beds, especially in the fall, and then just let it kind of soak in during the winter. So all, and people will put it on their house plants or in the soil when they're planting their houseplants. Dig a little hole around your fern, you know, your, your Boston fern or your fig tree or whatever, 
and give it a spadeful of compost, and it would be very happy. How do you spread it on your lawn? Um, I just take a shovel. I put it in a wheelbarrow and just take a shovel and just kind of fling it so that you have a thin oh, layer. Right. Depends on your lawn. I mean, I don't do anything to my lawn. I mow it. I grass mulch it. Um, but it, I mean, I've heard of people, you know, spray. I mean, farmers do this with, um, you know, piles of compost that they've generated in a farm that they spread, you know, 40 acre fields for alfalfa or whatever. It depends. Or if you have a patch you're trying to grow something new in, if you're trying to get grass that, you know, hasn't grown well in a certain area or whatever, then that might be a great place to put some down. I think it's good for trees, like especially if you have a tree that, um, Leave, loses its leaves too early. It's just kind of like a sign, I think. That it's a really slow-release food. Yeah. Very gentle feeding. And you put it like around where the leaves, not close to the root per se, but more so like around the edge. Around the, the drip line. The drip, the drip line. line. Yeah. 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 So you want to compost? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. <laughs> that what you I think I just heard you say all that. Actually, you heard me say the stuff on most of the stuff on the left and across the bottom, but almost nothing up the right. And most of the stuff up the right um, is the easier stuff, the less labor intensive. So I'm going to show you maybe four other tricks. Um, this is actually my favorite, and I used to use this all the time, trench composting. This is what I grew up with. You collected a bucket full of stuff, you took it out in the garden, you dug a hole and you buried it, and you let it decay, decompose in place. And I still use this all the time in my garden. We have areas that, you know, we aren't planting that season, and we are literally digging a hole, putting the bucket of stuff in, covering it up, and then the next hole goes right next to it. And then next year, it's terrific for you know, the garlic or the potatoes. So like with that method, and, and you had shown a picture of your compost pile, and I'm just mm -hmm. what you're doing. I'm just curious. How do you keep the critters from? From this? This is a bury it. This is a bury it deep. So I'll bury it a shovel deep. Oh, okay. So yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. That, that yeah. pile... <laughs> Disappeared several years. My compost pile disappeared several years ago because I wanted to put a garden bed there. So now it's fenced in and it's a, basically a tomato and, and squash bed. Um, I just built a compost pile literally like last week out of two sides of chicken wire under a hawthorn tree. And it's just open. And believe me, we live on the edge of the North Franklin wetland. <laughs> so we have plenty of creatures. I only a couple times if I had things come in yeah. and take. And I know we have we have raccoons. Yeah. We have skunks. We see them come, crop, yeah. go, go up the tree and take the suet. They'll take the suet that I have out for the birds, but they won't bother the compost pile. That's kind of preferred to do something like that. I was just curious about Or the other thing, again, is get one of those more sturdy yeah. bins or something with the top. So that's sometimes called direct compost. So this is kind of the old, really old-fashioned, great-grandma on the homestead, really easy way to recycle those nutrients. You want to get a little more sophisticated, this was, oh, wow, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago now, 12 years ago now, a book came out that was very popular for a while called Lasagna Gardening, making a new bed, so putting down layers of newspaper, layers of cardboard, and then layers of mulch and layers of compostable materials and let it rot for a season and then plant in that spot. So you've killed the grass underneath, the weeds underneath. You've basically let this stuff compost on top and you have this beautiful fertile soil on top. By the next season, the cardboard is decayed. You can just put a shovel in there and plant away. That's how I started all my raised beds. With lasagna gardening. Yeah. Yeah. Right over grass. And I'm betting that this, if Peter's Township Public Library doesn't have this, I'm sure they will interlibrary loan it for you. This one I haven't tried, and I am dying to try it. 
more things. To, Japanese tomato rings. You basically build a little tiny compost pile, put the tomatoes around it, dump finished compost, soil, your vegetable peelings, the, you know, raw materials in there, water it from the top down, and the water goes into the compost pile, lets it decay, and the nutrients leach out with the water and feed the tomatoes around it. I haven't tried this, so no personal experience, but lots of people swear by this. So this is another one that you may have heard a lot about Google culture. This is, this is taking compost way beyond the hedge prunings. This is taking it to huge logs and limbs, okay. So you bury the logs, the tree branches, the limbs, right? and just keep making layers of smaller and smaller things. You can bring in the weeds, the grass clippings, maybe the vegetable peelings at the top, a scattering of garden soil or finished compost on top. And they make these mounds that are about three feet tall and plant all over the surface. I haven't tried this but it is apparently really spreading through Europe and spreading through the permaculture world. The people who are really, really serious and hardcore about growing as much as they can in as little land as possible. So I have this going on right now. So I can start planting on top of it. Yep, you're supposed to be able to stop planting on top of it as soon as you build it. As soon as I can. Yep, and those logs and branches will decay not over you know, a season or a year, but over years. And you'll end up basically kind of at the bottom with this like forest, you know, loam material. Yeah, so this is a way more permanent. Now, this is kind of the, you know, it's essentially like a really woody compost pile without a container. I'm just worried about like animals coming into the that's a problem, right? Non-human animals. Um, yeah, I think a part of that comes back to how well you bury anything that they might be attracted to. But if you plant like vegetables on the top, you're gonna have to have to close. Depends it. depends on the veg. Yeah. It depends. Like I cannot keep kale in our yard, um, even on ground level with fencing around it because the baby groundhog gets in and takes it. I planted three rounds of kale and each time, no matter what I try to do, they eat it. On the other hand, this far away is a gorgeous stand of garlic, which nothing ever touches. So it really depends on how, what you have, how protected you have to do it. You have to make it. I have had deer eat leaves of zucchini. Oh, really? Yes. Um, peppers, not really much. The big things that don't get touched much in our yard are potatoes and alliums. So leeks, onions, shallots, garlic. I did have in the middle of January, in our terrible cold snap last Christmas time, solstice, winter solstice, we did have some leeks eaten by deer but otherwise they're standing. So it really depends on what the critters like. But if you don't like that approach and you want maybe a little more enclosure, try it in a raised bed. Think about, you've got one of those raised beds that are you know, all the rage now, buying the beautiful fancy ones or building the wood ones. That's a lot of bags of topsoil. You know, turn around and you're going to spend, what, $150, $200 filling that thing. It's eight feet long. It's three feet wide. It's two feet tall. My goodness, don't do that. If you have logs, decaying wood, branches. I literally I started a bin, one of those round bins. It's just like that tall, that big around. You know those tubs they get. They sell it or ace, wherever. I want to put some peppers and some dwarf peppers in there like two days ago. I'm like, oh my God, I don't have enough. I don't want to use all this expensive soil. Branches. I literally had a pile of branches that I was waiting to run through my chipper. And I'm like, no, I just took them 
cut them up, put about that many branches in the bottom, pack them tight, and then put some soil. And I probably used about a third less soil in there than I would have. So I just put in plain soil. And it's just going to decay. I could have put some, some cord up cardboard in there, newspapers, you know, grass clippings, whatever, to take up some of that space. So there are ways to fill these raised beds, no matter how you make it or buy it. Cheaper than buying all that soil. Straw bales. There's a theory. Yeah, there's a straw bale. There's a whole world of straw bale planting. Straw bales in the you could probably put straw bales in the bottom. All my stuff's a little smaller. Yeah, I don't know. The last time I bought straw bales for the standard square bale, which is really rectangular, Agway was charging $8.50. A piece. I didn't have to pay anything for my branches. So, and then yeah, another question: worms. Yeah. Can you use pine wood as a bottom bat? Yeah. Apparent. I haven't read to avoid anything except walnut, and they suggest not hickory or not cedar because they're so tough that they don't decay rapidly. That's why a lot of fence posts or old fence posts and old homesteads and farms made of hickory or cedar because they're pretty rot resistant. But pine, oh man, that's softwoods. And if you want some pets, if you'd like a few hundred or thousand pets, there's the whole world of vermicomposting and letting worms eat your garbage. I have not done this myself, but I did babysit for two weeks once. Um, and people will put them you know, in their basement or even in their kitchen. Another wonderful book if you're interested, this is kind of a classic book that started it all. Worms eat my garbage. So I can't help you much with that, although I am willing to babysit worms if you're nearby. So there are lots of ways. There are ways that are really labor intensive, money intensive, time intensive. There are ways that are much easier, much more accessible, for instance, for different time amounts you have, different physical abilities you have. It doesn't matter. One way or another, compost is going to happen. The only real impact is going to be how much air, how much water, and how much time is it going to take for it to happen. And what are you going to do with that compost? Well, one thing you can do with that compost is plant garlic. And another thing you can do with your time is come back or sign in, web people. Hi, I haven't forgotten you. Um, in September, right around the time to start getting those garlic beds ready and think about planting mid-October to late October, I'm going to come back and talk about garlic, focusing on stiff neck garlic. Hopefully, I will have a 2023 picture to add to my 2022 picture. I'm not trying to encourage you. Please don't enter the fair. I don't need <laughs> competition. Um, but so Sydney's invited me back to talk about growing gate garlic. I can talk about garlic forever, but this will be a shorter presentation than this one, unless you have a million questions, which is fantastic. And then we'll talk garlic all night. One quick question, Mark. which one's easier to braid, stiff neck or um, the soft, soft neck. the soft necks, soft necks don't have the scapes, right? So you don't get that part to eat. Oh, we'll talk. Soft, okay. necks. soft necks last longer. Okay. So they'll store and they might, you might have actually decent garlic nine months later to eat or whatever. Hard necks don't last as long, but a lot of people, they send up flower stalks. So, and they're called scapes and you can eat them. As a matter of fact, I just, they're fantastic. Oh my God. Um, so you get this harvest ending about now. I've been harvesting for about the last two or three weeks of scapes. So you get this early harvest before you ever dig the bulbs. But um, a lot of people like the flavor. There's a more variety of flavors, different heat, um, different levels of like juiciness or spiciness, but they tend not to store as long. So, you know, by January or so, they're starting to get a little mushy, a little brown. I planted a whole bunch and I don't remember which ones were soft and which ones are hard. I haven't even It should yet. have, I show you, I can show you pictures. Okay. It should have a stiff green stalk coming okay. up in the middle turning into a curly cue okay. and a um, basically a blossom forming at the end. So it'll be, it'll be enclosed in a little green sheath that'll get 
thinner and thinner and eventually it's beautiful. It'll look like a fire. It'll look like a firework of white flowers. Mm -hmm. It looks very much like chive flowers, except white or leaf flowers. Stiff. Those are the stiff necks. Yeah. Um, this is the shameless self-promotion. That's what told me I can do. I love talking about gardening in case you haven't noticed. And um, my things are, I really love alliums and nightshades. I really, really love garlic, leeks, um, shallots. I'm getting better at onions, but I love garlic and leeks. I love heirloom tomatoes. Um, and I love, love, love native plants for biodiversity. So I would love, if you have a group that you would like to have a speaker at, we can talk about this. Um, and these are just some of the, the talks that I have ready. I'm working on, I'm going to get one someday soon together about also um, backyard chickens.